Welcome to Freight Alley. I am Craig Fuller here for Fuller Speed. We're talking about the freight market and we're specifically talking about intermodal. That's the subject for today. I've got some folks in from Phoenix, Arizona that work for Swift. Um, tell us a little bit about your roles inside the organization and what it is that you're doing specifically to really uh, build the Swift brand and intermodal. Yeah, so thanks, thanks for having us today, Greg. We appreciate that. So, um, Dustin Ullman, I'm the Vice President of Intermodal. I lead the Intermodal line of business at Swift. Um, so what we're doing, you know, we're trying to, to differentiate ourselves in the market, really become you know, the go-to intermodal provider. We think that we have some advantages that allow us to be competitive. We think we have the expertise on our teams to allow us to be successful and we're really looking to grow the brand and you know, really provide customers with a differentiated option in the network. So we're excited for that. Uh, and I'm, I'm Shannon Brain. I'm the Senior Vice President of uh, Logistics and Intermodal. And, uh, you know, we're just excited about kind of a culture update, right? I mean, we've, we've been doing intermodal at Swift for 13 years now, um, a lot longer than people would have imagined. Mm -hmm. um, we're currently running about 11,000 boxes in the marketplace, which makes us unique and gives us some of the scale that Dustin's talking about. And, you know, we're excited to come here today, talk with you and your team, uh, get our operations staff, rally around some new initiatives that we're putting out there. Um, and just really excited to have our customers see what we're doing as well. So, so w when I think of Swift, I think of the Swift Trucking Company, but we're talking intermodal, which is goes beyond trucking. You mentioned it's been in the market for 13 years. How does a company with the scale of Swift treat intermodal? Yeah, I think historically, if you look back, intermodal was something that, you know, we heard a customer say this to us. We thought intermodal was something you guys did as a hobby. Um, you know, we really have focused on getting serious about it, making it a successful line of business, and really you know, promoting it to our customers and giving those customers the option to use multiple brands at Swift. So we're, you know, we're working to, to become you know, not just a hobby, but also a successful, competent service offering at Swift. I mean, 11,000 boxes is a ton of capacity. Mm -hmm. I imagine that when you have peak uh, surges that your customers are, are looking for, just the, the, just the scale of that is pretty tremendous. It puts you guys in the top five intermodal uh, carrier in the country? Absolutely, yeah. So we're, you know, we're at Freight Waves today doing our peak season planning meeting. So we, we think you know, with the 11,000 boxes that we have, with the customer relationships that we have, with our ability to, to scale, right? People don't think about Swift as having 11,000 containers. You know, they don't understand our capabilities and the things that we're able to really accomplish. So as we go through the peak season planning process and look at the ways that we can support customers differently, you know, we're, we're excited about what the future holds you know, for Swift Intermodal in general. And these 11 dozen boxes are container on flat car. Yep, 53 foot container on flat car. Got it. Any, inter, are they predominantly North American or domestic containers or yeah. do they go overseas? Um, they don't go overseas. So they, they run in the US, Mexico and Canada. Um, you know, that's really kind of our footprint where we focus. So how do you, you know, as you, as you think about uh, the success that you guys had of Intermodal, it's, I understand, a half billion dollar business. I mean, that's a, it's a very sizable uh, and significant uh, transportation company in itself. How do you think about uh, the, as you go to customers and they know the Swift brand is a trucking company, how do you position your Intermodal operations that are different than you would position your trucking operations? I don't know we position them any differently. I mean, I think our, our trucking is successful and has been successful for a very long time, right? Um, we're working on really, really growing the intermodal piece and making that as successful long term as the trucking side has been. So, you know, we, the, the driver support that we have on the line haul side, you know, we have the same driver support on the, the drayage side for the intermodal. We're, we're very happy about our driver population and what they're able to do and accomplish. And, how we're looking to support them in the future. You know, we, we take some of the trucking concepts that we use and how we support drivers on that side and apply it to the drayage world, which really allows us to be successful on the driving front. So hey, you guys are doing your own dray? We do. With your own drivers, the, the Swift drivers? Absolutely. We, I imagine that's a huge advantage of owning, you have the physical truck assets mm -hmm. under your dispatch combined with your boxes. I imagine that's an enormous advantage over traditional intermodal. Absolutely, you know, we feel that uh, you know, some of the synergies and you know, efficiencies that we have on the line haul trucking side, we can apply those to the drayage side, which you know, when you talk about differentiating us in the market, that's a differentiator that we're, we're proud of. You know, we're proud to be a trucking company. We, we really take that you know, in every line of business. And I think when you talk positioning, right, and you work within the behemoth that is, that is Swift, 
Um, you know, when you've got the second biggest dedicated operation and the biggest over the road trucking operation, I think when we talk about positioning, it's events like this, it's getting people together, it's talking about what we can do uh, from an intermodal perspective, because people just don't perceive those things when you sit behind those massive other entities that we have in the market. So. No, it's, it's amazing just having you guys here and hearing about this half billion dollar business uh, and just the scale of the 11,000 boxes. And I think about just the amount of capacity you can offer customers and just the uh, level of resources is pretty tremendous. And as, it, as you mentioned, I mean, it, uh, Swift is a four and a half billion dollar company. So it's, a, it's, a, it's not as big as some of the other sec, uh, part of it, but it's in a, in a peak season when you're running peak and you're, and you're trying to provide more solutions around capacity, it's a pretty important resource. Yeah, and I think you talked about resources too, right? Our ability to scale, right? We've added 1,200 or so containers this year, and obviously the market's been uh, a little bit lighter than we would have mm -hmm. loved it to be, uh, being, an, in, being an asset provider that we are. But, you know, as we continue to grow this, create more customer relationships, continue to enhance our network, we're committed to, to growing more cans in the future. And, and it's, a, it's mode agnostic, right? Is that the when you guys go to market and you're talking to uh, customers, um, have we seen a point because I remember when I was in trucking, it was, you're not putting that on the train. You can't go on the train. But are you seeing a transition where shippers are comfortable with it being mode agnostic? Or is there still some, some resistance yeah, to I think, it? Yeah, I think shippers like to know how their freight's moving. Um, I don't know that it's necessarily preference truck or train, but I think they like to know. Most customers like to dictate, hey, I want this moving on a truck because I want it getting there at that specific time versus the potential fluctuations in transit time and the potential slower transit time that exists on the train. So I think I think shippers still want to exist in a world where they know and control that mode, but most shippers are becoming more open, you know, to train as trains become more consistent in their service offerings and things of that nature. And just the access capacity, Correct. trickle around surges that we see in retail seasons and peak. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's absolutely easier for us to get, you know, 10 boxes into California during peak season than 10 trailers and 10 drivers, right? So. Yeah. I wouldn't, I, wouldn't just say, I wouldn't say as much mode agnostic as much as solution agnostic too, right? So, so when we have our account management teams and our sales teams that represent the enterprise, right, and they're able to reach out, we're able to offer more solutions with the 60,000 trailers and the 11,000 boxes. So if it does go on truck, I, I agree with Dustin, they're going to want to know, hey, what's your solution? Right. But at the end of the day, they, they're calling one place and they can get a solution. So. And it's your assets. I think, right. you know, particularly in an environment where you know, there's a lot of attention paid into to trucking and who has control of the freight. You know, visibility has become a pretty hot topic. And, and I think perhaps more importantly, it's the fact that the freight is running on your network under your boxes should give shippers a lot of comfort of, of knowing there's, there's this massive company if something does happen. Because in, inevitably in freight, it's, something's going to go wrong, no matter how good your operations are because it's the nature of moving product. It's that resource when something does go wrong that you can manage exceptions better than most because of the resources. Absolutely, and I think, you know, hey, there's a reason if you go down the road right now, you're gonna see a Swift truck and trailer on the road, right? The scale that we have, you know, the, the just the overall national network that we have from a trucking standpoint, is really, really unmatched, right? I mean, so you take those advantages to the intermodal side, just the solution set that you can deliver to a customer's Pretty powerful. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's, there's many that can, that can provide a full solution set the way that Swift can. By the way, congratulations on a great 2019. You guys have done well. You, a night, you've merged Night Swift. You talked about culture. I'm wondering, from a cultural standpoint, how does a, a company like Night Swift, same city, comp really big competitors, a lot of history in that competition and that, and that uh, rivalry, if you cross town rivalry. How do you integrate the two, and how do you, uh, from a cultural standpoint, uh, bring the best of all worlds together? Yeah, I think I think it starts at the top, right? I mean, when you know Kevin Knight, a lot of respect in the industry. Um, obviously, Jerry uh, working, you know, hand in hand with Kevin to kind of say, hey, let's do this collectively. Uh, really set the tone for the organization and our leadership, you know, from the get go. I think the biggest thing I would just say is everybody working together, right? So we talk, we express, you know, the the benefits of working with truck and all that we can bring through uh, intermodal and truck. But I would say via the merger, the, the 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 tone that was set early was, hey, no silos. We're all going to work together, 
right? And I would just tell you what happens in big companies and big organizations is there just tends to be a siloed approach where each division starts to take care of itself and, and you lose that continuity, right? Yeah. And so at the top, when you talk culturally, it was set the tone really early by, by Kevin and our uh, executive team that, hey, we're all gonna work together um, to, to make Swift great and we're gonna use all the resources to bear and hey, the businesses that we have will be successful. And I think when we've brought sales and technology and operations and a lot of things together, you've seen you know some of those results mm -hmm. that you were talking to. Yeah, I mean, the, from a financial standpoint, from a Wall Street standpoint, even in a soft market like we had this year, you guys have had a remarkable year. Congratulations on that. I think, you know, as a media outlet, you look at these things and sort of the story will play out. And there was, you know, there was some skepticism, not necessarily by us, but by others, about whether Knight and Swift could come together and, and actually perform. It's obviously, obviously worked out well, and I think culture probably drives a lot of that. Plus, the solutions that you guys have actually enhances your customer experiences. I think, you know, you, you, you talk to our leadership group and, and people is the driving force behind everything that we do. So we've got great teams of people pushing every day to make us successful. So at the end of the day, you know, the differentiator there is just, you know, we put people in the right places to be successful, give them the tools to be successful, and we see that success. So Yeah, I mean, I, I've been around trucking for, for uh, my whole life, and I've seen a lot of M&A. I've seen a lot of bad M&A um, where... A larger company buys a smaller one, or, or uh, companies of equal size uh, merge, um, and it's oftentimes those don't go as planned. I think in this case, this is a, a, a at least financially looking at it from you guys have actually met those marks, and so I, I think congratulations. Wait, 2019 has a, been a really strange year in the freight market. I mean, it's just it's just it's just been different. Um, what do you see for the rest of the year? Um, you know, we've seen a lot of the analytics. I mean, obviously, we're pretty bullish, though. I mean, you see an you know, uptick in the, in the last uh, few weeks, uh, you know, the load offerings, the stuff coming through, mm -hmm. some of the networks, um, you know, kind of filling up with, with, with loads. Um, so, so we're pretty bullish about the fourth quarter, and we're positioned to do well, obviously, as you mentioned, in, in all types of quarters. Uh, I think that, that really sets us apart with, with our asset presence. You know, I mean, there's a lot of conversations you know, the, the digital transformation and all that, but we, we still uh, love and believe in, in the people and the assets that, that, that make up the industry, and we, we invest heavily in that. And, and so we're excited about, I think, the rest of the year and pretty bullish about a, a good fourth quarter and some strong retail seasons. So. And, and you said you are seeing at the end of July and August, you guys have seen some additional surges yeah. or at least signs of improvement in the market. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, that's, I mean, our channel checks, J, JP and I host a, weekly rate update show and we talked about that where there have been signs of of uh more volume than than what we saw in the uh, uh earlier part of the year and just that there's signs of strength actually happening i think it's certainly encouraging particularly for larger asset-based carriers in a market where there's more retail focus um where there's more moving into peak season um and i think around intermodal if, if we can keep the consumer spending money and buying product, then retailers will sell. It's a good sign for the fourth quarter. Yeah, for sure. I mean, our goal, right, is to put, to put our assets, our cans, and our people in a spot to be successful. So, you know, we're working through that now. We have, we'll have a, an excellent plan. You know, we'll, we'll execute appropriately. So we're, we're excited about the back half. Are you fully allocated for capacity, or is there still options and opportunities? Yeah, there's, for there's always options, right? You know, as you're, you're managing a, a growth business unit, you always have options, um, so. You, you mentioned, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the digital brokers or the digital freight companies and a lot of innovation. We're a, we're a company that's venture back, but, but I also come from a traditional trucking background, so I sit, sort of sit in between those and cover the story. I'm, I'm curious from your perspective where you see these companies get billion dollar valuations that are that are much smaller just in terms of gross revenues, not even mentioned net. How does that, how do you guys look at those uh, businesses and how do you think uh, when, you're, when you're going to market, how do you guys think of uh, the perception of Swift and, and the broader ecosystem that you're in? I think, I think it challenges us just to, to continue to improve on the 70 plus years of legacy that we have, right? I mean, you've built a network and industry leading size um, but these new entrants have challenged us to just, hey, how are we connecting with our customers? Um, what, how, what's our service with the customers? Uh, how are we communicating transit times, um, API connectivity, stuff like that. So, so stuff that you know, has challenged us to continue to, to keep pace, 
um, but we still love our position because the biggest of shippers love assets, they love the capacity, they love the trailer network, they love the security, they love the safety uh, that we provide. And so... And the longevity. Yeah. Like if, you know, the, 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 it's not true of every... Uh, the, some VC-backed companies have raised a lot of capital and, and will probably be very successful in their own right. But there are many of those upstarts that don't have the financial wherewithal if, they, if an accident happens. We've seen lawsuits. There's actually a story we wrote a few weeks ago about freight brokerages end up are now uh, attorneys are now going after them specifically and, and, and trying to determine whether they did the proper diligence. And I think, um, you know, having that asset mindset sort of installs a level of credibility with you guys around safety and around compliance. But also if something does, does go wrong, you know, the, the folks know that you guys are going to be around. Yeah. Yeah. We just want to make sure we, we, we talk about that message and what we can do there. And, you know, I think that goes, uh, a little bit under the radar with the safety and, and all the stuff that goes into running an asset network of our size. Yeah, but we're, we're really proud of it. You've on safety and safety regulation yeah. and legislation. It's yeah, absolutely. I mean, safety is the top of our priority list, right? If you're going to run a successful trucking company, you've got to be safe. Um, you know, we, we talk about it every day, talk about it every conversation that we have with drivers, right? So, so as we look to be successful, a key component is, of that is making sure that we have a safe culture. Not just safe, you know, in one day or in one, you know, at one point of time, but about being safe every day and you just think safety. Yeah. I always uh, talk to a lot of non-asset guys who don't have any assets. It's just interesting to think because the mentality is this is the load and I only have to worry about what happens when the transaction's on my system. Mm -hmm. The moment it's built, I'm out. Whereas an asset-based background, you have to consider all of the pieces. You know, you, 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 that driver is working for you guys. In the case of Intermodal, that box is your box. And it's not just handing it off and letting it go. There's a lot of value in the fact that you are able to manage the transaction from point to point. And I think there's a lot of value in shippers as they look at who they're doing business with, asset and non-asset inside of assets adds a lot of value. And I think there's a, you know, it's interesting, I, I've talked to some of the larger asset carriers, and I think in this cycle, unlike 15 and 16, is that the shippers are more reluctant to pull freight away from the asset carriers because when the market inevitably turns, and it, it may be doing now, or it may, you know, may take a few months before it really turns, um, they don't want to be left without assets. They don't want to be left and dry and have to pay, or have freight, worst case, have freight left at the dock, which happened a lot last year. Yeah, and I think that's a unique spot about having as many assets as we do in the intermodal space, just in that particular segment of our business, is that when we're making commitments now, and part of our network realignment is we're making long-term commitments, not just for peak. I mean, we clearly have surge agreements, but hey, what are we going to be doing in 19? And so we're having those conversations, and our customers are, are liking those conversations because it gives them some diversity mm -hmm. uh, that in the intermodal space they, they may not you know, have always had. Yeah, 2020 is going to be interesting. I think the end of this year and moving into 2020 is going to be interesting to see how uh, w all the stuff that's taking place in the market um, uh, heading into next year. It's an exciting time. It's also a, a time where a lot of stuff is happening. There's a lot of noise out there. There's a lot of investment that's going into the space. So um, I'm, I'm excited and optimistic about the future. And really appreciate you guys coming to Chattanooga here today at Freight Alley. We're excited to have you. Anything that you want to leave uh, in terms of the, the where Intermodal's headed or where Swift's headed? Yeah, I think, you know, our message is consistent to customers, consistent to our team. You know, we are looking at growth as, as our future, right? Intermodal is not a hobby for Swift. It's something that we're here to do and here to do successfully for a long time. So I think that, that for us is kind of the key message that we have going into, you know, 2020 and beyond. And if, if a customer has specific interest around intermodal, are they contacting their, their, their rep that calls on them on the Swift brand, or is there a specific group that they yeah, should reach so out we, to? We, our, our sales team sells cross-line cross of business. So our sales team does an excellent job of selling all modes of transportation at Swift. So you know, the typical Swift salesperson that you deal with today is the same person that you could reach out to with intermodal needs. So we're, we're, we're very happy with our kind of aligned sales structure. What that allows us to do is we talk about our size and scope. Well, guys, thank you so much. Appreciate Thanks for coming it. in. Appreciate it.